June 1984, NSA Washington campus, Fort Meade, Maryland. A small parking lot near Operations Building 3. A line of trucks comes in and stops by several unmarked trailers. Out of the trucks, workers begin unloading huge packages covered in plastic and burlap. One by one, the packages are carried into one trailer, then another. To get here, these packages have traveled a long way. They came from Moscow, USSR. Inside one of these packages was a tiny device, smaller than a pencil. This device was the focus of an entire secret operation, which only a handful of NSA specialists even knew about. A counterintelligence effort so secret, most people involved in it had no idea how it worked. And this effort would become the granddaddy of all the cyber operations of the United States intelligence agencies. All the surveillance, all the hacking, all the cyber attacks. Stuxnet, Eternal Blue, Equation, everything began right here in this parking lot with Project Gun. The story begins several months earlier. It's the height of the Cold War. Nuclear standoff, Berlin Wall, spy games, all the usual stuff. The entire world was split in two with one exception, embassies. Both the Soviet Union and the United States had these small patches of land in each other's territories. And no, they weren't officially considered foreign soil, but it was the closest you could get to that. The American embassy in Moscow was a massive Stalinist Gothic building in the middle of the city. 10 floors of America, less than two miles from the Red Square. Not only was it a diplomatic link between the US and the Soviet Union, all the spying went through there too. So as you might imagine, those 10 floors were chock full of secrets the Soviets were very eager to get their hands on. And they tried constantly. The building was erected in the 50s, and for decades after that, the staff kept finding recording devices embedded in the furniture, the walls, the concrete beams, basically everywhere. On a roof across the street, the Soviets even mounted a massive emitter that would blast the embassy with microwaves. Some say it was an unsuccessful attempt to give the American staff cancer. A more realistic version was that the Soviets were remotely charging all the surveillance equipment hidden inside the embassy. Nobody had any illusions that the building wasn't full of bugs, but finding all of them, or at least knowing what and how they recorded, was crucial. The lives of American spies all across the USSR depended on that. Though sometimes, the staff would get some help. For example, in 1983, French and Italian diplomats found some bugs hidden in their teletype machines, basically typewriters that work remotely. The French tipped off the Americans, hinting that similar bugs were likely in their teletypes too. The devices were extremely complicated for the period, just hundreds of pounds of electronics. You could not hope for a better place to hide a small recorder. Okay, teletypes were probably bugged. What else? The embassy was full of similar electronic equipment. Computers, radio devices, even typewriters. Tons of the stuff. Literal metric tons. And somehow you had to look for those bugs without raising any suspicions. Because if the Soviets caught wind that you were looking for the bugs, they could temporarily remove or disable them. Even President Ronald Reagan was invested in the mission. He signed off on it personally and gave the task of finding the bugs in the embassy's equipment to the one man who could do it right. Walter G. Dealey, NSA's Deputy Director of Communication Security. In fact, he was given the job after personally contacting Reagan and offering himself and his agency. It's important to point out that back in the 80s, the NSA wasn't this massive boogeyman of a federal institution we see today. It was formed in the 50s out of previous counterintelligence efforts and was basically tasked with all kinds of signal monitoring. Yeah, cryptographic this and radiographic that looked very cool back then, but nobody took them very seriously. At least until 1983, when Dealey came forward and told Reagan, we can find that damn bug. We can assume Reagan liked the attitude. Now all that was left was to find the damn thing. But before that, let me tell you about this episode's sponsor, you. That's right, we can do these videos purely because of your support right here on YouTube. Your likes, subscribes, and comments help move us forward. So yeah, thanks. Okay, back to the 10-story embassy in Moscow. The NSA wanted to get the bugged equipment out of the embassy without raising any suspicions. So it came up with a story that the tech was getting upgraded. In reality, they didn't upgrade anything. They just bought a direct duplicate of all the equipment and flew it to the USSR. 
The old equipment then had to be packed up and sent back to the US, which was easier said than done. There were 10 tons of it. And those teletype machines, they were massive. When the Soviets noticed that the American staff was bringing in the new upgraded stuff, they turned off the electricity for the entire building for, you know, maintenance. So the elevators were out of the question and the 10 tons had to be carried by hand up and down through the entire building. The staff collected all the equipment on one floor and packed it with special tamper-proof bags. The only place to get those bags was the US. So if the Soviets ever tried to remove a secret bug from the equipment transport, the NSA would have no difficulty in finding that out. Finally, the equipment was transported to an airport, then flown to Frankfurt, and then to Washington, D.C. Okay, what's next? You have to look through it somehow. It's awfully complex. There are transistors upon transistors. So how do you find that one chip that does not belong? Basically, Dealey created this setup. He put two large trailers in a parking lot near the NSA headquarters. One of the trailers was for a portable x-ray machine. The technicians would take each piece of equipment out of the bag and x-ray it. Then, in another trailer, a technician would painstakingly compare the photo with a schematic of the same part, trying to find discrepancies. The project was marked VRK, Very Restricted Knowledge, which is one of those super strict above top secret designations whose very existence wasn't even known until the 90s. If back then you even mentioned this three letter combination, the NSA people would pretend you were talking nonsense, and that would be the last thing you ever did. Or as Dealey himself put it, VRK means that he'll cut off your private parts if you breathe a word about what you're doing. So, there were around 25 agents on the job, supervised by Dee Lee and a couple other top dogs. Nobody else knew about Project Gunman, not even the embassy staff back in Moscow. For them, it was just another equipment upgrade. In Washington, the people worked shift after shift through nights and weekends, just hours after hours of comparing photos with schematics in a cramped trailer until one day, one employee looked at a photo and saw this. And we actually know what he said at that exact moment. He said, holy f It was a cross-section of this aluminum bar in a typewriter, a small bar that basically doesn't allow the machine to break in half. It was just crammed with electrical parts that did not belong there. Somebody took a metal bar, hollowed it out, and stuffed it full of electronics. Holy f the way it worked is actually pretty interesting. The typewriter wasn't your typical grandma clack clack thing that you see in spy movies. It was an IBM Selectric 2, a sophisticated electromechanical machine with lots of moving parts. After you pressed a key, it would move a small lever called an interposer. The lever would move some other levers and all of that would move this small ball with metal letters on it. The ball would rotate and press an inked piece of film into the paper. The movements of those parts was incredibly minuscule and precise. Truly a typewriter for the space age. So how do you record that? Well, you put an array of tiny magnetometers into this bar. Basically, they're devices that sense the proximity of magnets. Each time the magnetized lever comes by, a magnetometer gets triggered. The signals would then be transmitted to a small microchip for encoding. This part is really quite fascinating. The Soviets didn't have a memory device that could hold multiples of six, so exactly 30, 36, or 42 bits. 32 was all they had. So this encoder would compress a six-bit message into a four-bit one. As soon as that memory got filled up, its contents would be sent through a miniature antenna to be picked up by a larger antenna on the embassy's roof. The sophistication of the whole thing by 80s standards was just off the charts. The NSA had no idea that the Soviets were capable of creating anything like that, let alone secretly installing it in embassy equipment. And if that wasn't a wake-up call, the NSA didn't know what was. And here's where we encounter James R. Gosler, a man many regard as the godfather of American cyber war. Gossler didn't work on Project Gunman directly, but he was in the NSA at the time. A few years later, he became the director of the Clandestine Information Technology Office at the CIA, which was the agency's first attempt to go all in on cyber. And when a New York Times journalist asked Gossler about the importance of Project Gunman to the American spy efforts, he said there were basically two eras, before Gunman and after Gunman. In the BG era, nobody took the NSA seriously. The CIA didn't employ cyber espionage at all, 
And everybody was still in the Cold War mode of sending James Bond types whenever some spying was needed. An interesting example of the American espionage effort from this era was Operation Monopoly, which happened before Project Gunman back in the 70s. Tell me if it sounds familiar. The Soviet Union had just built a new embassy in Washington, D.C., and the American government thought it would be a really good idea to plant some bugs in it, just to have a sneak peek. But instead of spicing up Soviet typewriters, they began digging a tunnel under the embassy. Yeah, they hired a contractor, bought a neighboring lot, and began digging a tunnel to get to the embassy and spy on it that way. The Soviets quickly caught wind of what they were doing, the tunnel had to be abandoned, and Operation Monopoly was a massive failure. Operation Gunman was a slap in the face to the NSA, the CIA, and all the other A's. The Soviets were planning these super high-tech bugs while the Americans were digging tunnels? So Dealey, Gosler, and a lot of other very important people got together and decided enough is enough. Their spying game had to get to a new level. And that's how we are where we are now. You have things like Stuxnet, a little piece of malware that destroyed Iran's nuclear program and that the CIA spent over a billion dollars to develop. You have massive surveillance programs that suck up intelligence about everything and everybody. And you have not a hacker army, but an entire ecosystem of hacker armies that all work in unison. So yeah, while most of the history of the American cyber warfare is classified, maybe the most important story, the inciting incident, is the one thing we do know about. And that's Project Gunman. Thanks for watching. I hope you find this story as fascinating as we did. If you want more explainers like this, let us know in the comments and maybe watch our other videos about everything cyber. We have an entire video about the operation that kickstarted China's hacking efforts. Thanks and see you next time.